Munir Redfer stepped out of the officers' quarters at Al Rashid Airfield in southeastern Baghdad and sucked in a deep breath of the dry morning air. In the distance, he could hear the telltale sounds of aircraft tractor engines and shouts of the ground crew as they fettled the base's various aircraft for the day's sorties. Despite his outwardly calm appearance and manner, Redfer's heart was pounding as he walked to and into the mess. Breakfast passed in a blur, the morning briefing too. Before he knew it, he was in his flight suit, walking around the silvery perimeter of his MiG-21 F-13. He patted the long, sleek drop tank attached to the centerline station, double-checked that the hoses were correctly plumbed. He had waited months for this moment. Christian pilots were regarded with great suspicion by the high command, even skilled combat veterans like Munir Redfer. Flying with a drop tank was therefore usually prohibited even though the MiG-21 was a more balanced and formidable fighter when carrying one. Today's training flight would be his first long-range sortie for many months, and a solo no less. No sense in putting hours on another airframe. Just to be sure, he'd persuaded the Iraqi ground crew to top the tanks up right to the brim. Usually he would have needed permission from the Soviet minders to do that but no one liked those arrogant bastards. The crew chief had agreed with a smirk and a wink. Munir taxied and took off. Iraqi radar coverage was patchy, despite the ground control intercept training that had been drilled into them by their Soviet instructors. Even so, they picked him up going west. Business-like queries quickly turned into threats. He turned the radio off. Redfer crossed the northeastern Jordanian border at high altitude at more than 600 knots, scanning the sky through the MiG's small canopy, hoping that even if detected, the Royal Jordanian Air Force's hunters would be too slow to catch him. Streaking above the mountains below, alone in the cloudless sky, he soon crossed another border. The Israeli mirages appeared as if by magic, two racy deltas. One of the pilots came alongside, flashing a hand signal. Follow me. Redford gave a thumbs up and eased the MiG into a shallow break to follow. A warning light on the panel showed that he was onto his reserve fuel after the long high speed run. For the first time, he felt a tingle of fear. He couldn't be foiled at the final moment. No, the long black tarmac of Hatsaw Airfield appeared out of the green plains below, familiar from the sighting run he'd made during his secret trip to Israel. He lined up, lowered the gear and, with a surge of elation, he felt the wheels touch. The drag chute deployed, the big ventral speed brake opened and the MiG slowed, engine idling. He was met on the taxiway by a stocky, dark-haired man wearing a flight suit. The Israeli threw him a quick salute and then, to Munir's surprise, he walked straight past, expertly ascended the ladder that had been placed against the fuselage and seated himself in the cramped cockpit. Redfer was able to catch a momentary glimpse of the pilot's name patch as he passed, Shapira, and then he was whisked away by a gaggle of armed Mossad agents. One of the many stories about the legendary IAF test pilot Danny Shapira is that he familiarised himself with the MiG-21's controls, which were all labelled in Cyrillic, while the ground crew fueled up the aircraft. Then he strapped himself in and took it for a spin. It wouldn't surprise me if it's true. But in any case, over the coming months, Shapira and the IAF put the MiG-21 through its paces, testing every aspect of the aircraft's performance in detail. The fishbed was a rich prize, the most advanced export product of the Soviet Union's aviation program, and thus the most advanced aircraft available to Israel's enemies. Understanding how it performed against the IAF's mirages and how its weaknesses could be exploited was a crucial competitive advantage. When the IAF launched the Six-Day War on the 5th of June 1967, it needed every aircraft it could get its hands on, so the MiG-21 was repainted in high-visibility Israeli markings, armed with Shafir air-to-air missiles, and put on quick reaction alert at Hatsaw. It was never scrambled. Having got the most out of the captured MiG, the IAF then decided to use it as a political bargaining chip. Besides introducing it to James Bond, 
they also struck a deal with the US via CIA director Richard Helms in exchange for an agreement to supply the versatile and powerful F-4 Phantom, the IAF agreed to loan them the MiG-21. The aircraft was shipped to Groom Lake, Nevada, where it became the centerpiece of a major foreign materiel exploitation initiative, Have Donut. The MiG-21 was of great interest to the USAF and the US Navy as well as being representative of the most advanced serving Soviet air superiority fighter, it was also the most advanced fighter in service with the Vietnam People's Air Force, and the MiG-21 was proving to be a problem. Fishbed sightings had increased during the summer of 1966. On July the 12th, two MiG-21s had attacked an Ironhand flight and been shot down by the F-4 escort. Sightings decreased for a time. Then, on October 5, 1966, two F-4C Phantoms were escorting two EV-66s, which were providing jamming support for strikes around Hanoi. While in orbit, one of the EV-66 pilots spotted a Phantom going down in flames. It had been hit by an R-3S Atoll, fired by a MiG-21 that the Phantom crews had not detected. On October 9, the same thing happened to a Navy F-4B crew. The MiG's speed, low visual signature, and air-to-air missile capability posed a much greater threat than the antiquated MiG-17, even though operations like Bolo demonstrated that the USAF and Navy could beat it, the fishbed was a problem, exacerbated by the declining quality of TAC air-to-air skills as the 100 mission rule took hold. The F-13 was the most common export variant of the first-generation fishbed. NATO generally referred to it as a fishbed E. This type of MiG-21 was a relatively simple, short-range interceptor designed for clear air mass operations. By US standards of the time, it was very lightly armed. The primary weapons were two infrared homing Vimpel R-3S Atoll missiles under the wings. These were essentially an AIM-9B sidewinder, but with somewhat reduced seeker performance. They were only useful in a 30-degree cone off the rear of an enemy aircraft and had a realistic range of about a mile and a half in a tail chase. Launching the weapon with high closure speed and from below both increased that range and made it easier for the missile sensors to pick up the target against the relatively flat infrared backdrop of the sky. This is one reason why the VPAF fishbed pilots, or rather their ground controllers, preferred hit-and-run attacks. Another was that they had no need to actually engage in a dogfight with more numerous, better equipped, and typically better trained US aviators. Often, the appearance of the MiGs was enough to make strike fighters jettison their bomb loads, and that was mission accomplished for the VPAF. Sticking about was a pointless risk. This version of the fishbed also carried a 30mm cannon under the fuselage with 60 rounds. BPAF aviators rarely used these weapons. Interestingly, Egyptian, Syrian and Pakistani pilots who used the fishbed in combat preferred the cannon and were far more willing to use the MiG-21 as the formidable dogfighter that it actually was. They regarded the atoll as practically useless against another fighter. Less commonly, the Fishbed E could also carry two pods of 16 57mm folding fin aircraft rockets under the wings. These were used from time to time by the VPAF. The MiG was a small aircraft by contemporary standards. It was 44.2 feet long, with a wingspan of just 23.47 feet, according to the very precise measurements made by DIA. Takeoff weight was 17,286 pounds, with a maximum weight of 18,072 pounds. US aviators had a reasonable understanding of MiG 21 tactics. US intelligence had acquired a selection of manuals and specifications over the years, but theory is no replacement for practice. They had little knowledge of the ultimate performance of the MiG 21 when flown to its maximum potential. 
although the VPAF weren't willing to risk their small fleet in a genuine fight for air superiority, the Warsaw Pact would have no such scruples. Phantom pilots would have to fight a fully committed opponent for keeps. The Have Donut, named for the shape of the canopy-mounted site, arrived in January 1968. From the 23rd of January to the 8th of April, 102 sorties were flown for 77 hours of total flight time. This is actually quite interesting in and of itself. As I said, the MiG-21 was a short-range fighter, and I meant it. The VPAF saw 45 minutes of flight time as a long mission. North Vietnam was therefore the perfect battle area for the fish bed, as nowhere was more than 20 minutes away. Syria would prove similar in 1973. The fish bed carried 4,600 pounds of fuel internally, supplemented by 880 pounds in a centre-line drop tank. DIA calculated a strike radius of 370 miles. That's 426 regular miles, or 685 kilometres with the external fuel tank. Incidentally, the distance from Baghdad to Hatsor is about 1,100 kilometres, so you can see why Redfer wanted that external tank filled up. Contrast this short mission duration to the F-4 community, which would typically fly two and a half to three hour missions involving at least one trip to the tanker. The Air Force got hold of the MiG first. I think it's important to factor into their assessment that this was the SAC-dominated air force of the 1960s. Air-to-air -air fighting was considered a secondary mission to ground attack with nuclear weapons. Air combat manoeuvring was therefore rather restricted. Practicing it was generally regarded as untidy and risky. Dogfight training was limited to learning how to keep formation in a flying wing. Max performance exploitation of an aircraft was forbidden because it increased the chances of accidents. Dissimilar training, doubly so. I think I'm correct in saying that in the event of an accident that caused the loss of an airframe, the squadron commander would automatically be dismissed. Preventing accidents was therefore paramount in the stateside air force. The fighter weapons school at Nellis was subject to exactly the same restrictions as the rest of the air force and thus focused primarily on the delivery of air-to-ground ordnance. But they were still keen to see what the MiG could do. To that end, they flew missions against the F-4C D&E, the F-105 D&F, the brand new F-111A, the F-100D Super Sabre, F-104D Starfighter, and F-5A Freedom Fighter. The design compromises created by MiG OKB's ruthless focus on building a ground controlled interceptor were immediately apparent to the Air Force pilots. Lack of visibility was the biggest issue. There was a 50 degree cone aft in which the pilot could see nothing but various bits of the aircraft. Visibility directly forward was also compromised by the sight and the thick bulletproof glass. Visual acquisition of large aircraft like the F-4 and F-105 was only possible between 3 and 5 miles. A MiG pilot would have very poor situational awareness in a dogfight and their ability to exploit the fishbed's small visual signature was compromised. The next significant limitation was aerodynamic. Below 15,000 feet, the fishbed pilot had to deal with a great deal of buffeting if he tried to accelerate through Mach 1. In the Air Force's view, this made the aircraft unusable as a weapons platform. And although below this speed the fishbed exhibited higher instantaneous turning performance than the US fighters, it was unable to maintain speed in high G turns as well as the Phantom. Although the MiG had a powerful engine, the US test showed that it was not very responsive. For example, going from idle to full military power on the ground took 15 seconds. 85 to 100% throttle in flight took 10 seconds. Keeping formation in flight was therefore tricky, as was accelerating from low speed during a dogfight. The MiG's cannon armament came in for harsh criticism. With only 60 rounds available, accurate shooting was imperative. 
This was hard because the MiG's gun sight did not provide accurate lead when shooting and the pipper jittered when the gun was fired, making it hard to keep the stream of shells on target. The gun sight was also useless when the fish bed was pulling more than 3G because the pipper drifted off the bottom of the windshield. Not ideal. Nor was the cockpit layout, which was best described as haphazard. Switch grouping was poor, making instinctive use of major controls tough to develop. Most warning lights were located outside of the line of sight. The pilot would have to be looking in their direction to notice them. This was a consistent problem with MiGs of the era, and something I find quite odd. The whole strategic concept behind these aircraft was quantity over quality. They were exported to less experienced air forces and operated by less experienced and well-trained pilots in the USSR. You would have thought that ease of use would have been a crucial design criteria. It's fine to build something that performs when used by the best pilots, but by definition most of the time it'll be flown by the average. And yet Soviet era MiG cockpits were consistently a weak point. Even so, the MiG could be a deadly opponent even when flown within the safety restrictions that TAC imposed. F-4 pilots could control an engagement against the MiG below 15,000 feet, being able to exploit the fishbed's transonic buffeting issues, very high control forces and limited visibility. The Phantom was also much more accelerative in this domain, giving it freedom to use vertical manoeuvres to counteract the MiG's superior turn rate. In essence, the Air Force concluded that the MiG was substantially inferior to the Phantom. As we'll see in a short while, this said more about the Air Force test pilots than the aircraft itself. Because of the MiG's small size and smokeless engine, the TAC recommended that the two and four aircraft in a cap formation focus on visual scanning in the rear quarter, while the front focus on radar scanning forward. There was no suggestion of a change in formation to something more effective like loose juice. That discussion was verboten. The F-4 and F-100 were the TAC's other main workhorses during Rolling Thunder. Neither fared well against the fishbed. Against my expectations, the Thud actually gets a better report card against the fishbed than the Hun. Because the Air Force was obsessed by the buffeting issue, the F-105's ability to match the fishbed's acceleration up to Mach 0.98 below 15,000 feet and then easily go beyond was seen as a critical advantage. The Thud's air-to-air armament was also seen as being superior. The M61 Vulcan both offered a higher weight of fire and a stream of shells that was easier to aim. The Thunder Chief's gun sight was also markedly superior. My view is that in making this assessment, I believe that the Air Force missed a key point about the Thud's gun sight. Because they were often bounced by MiGs, either on an attack run or while waiting to roll into one, Thud pilots were typically in the wrong mode for air-to-air. This meant that they were essentially shooting over open sights without lead computation until they could flip modes, which required about 15 seconds to achieve. 70% of F-105 air-to-air gun engagements were made without the assistance of a computing gun sight. Inevitably, the advice to the F-105 community was to avoid any form of turning fight with the fishbed. They were only advised to attack in a situation in which they could hit and run. The THUD's radar warning receiver offered no advanced warning of an attack so its pilot would have to rely on visual scanning to avoid an ambush. Easier said than done. Moving on, the F-100 had actually scored the TAC's first MiG kill of the war, but the F-100 was outclassed by the fishbed, which turned better and accelerated faster. Inevitably, exploiting the buffet was the main advice to pilots. I'm not sure a loaded F-100D could realistically accelerate faster to evade a MiG-21 using that method, but there we are. If the pilot did get into a good position, then the Hun's cannon setup and gun sight was rated superior, as was the AIM-9B. A third strike aircraft was entering the fleet at this time. The F-111A was intended as a replacement for the Thud. Bigger, faster, 
Packed with new technology and able to carry even heavier bomb loads, the Aardvark was, unfortunately, very vulnerable to the MiG. Don't even think about engaging one, was the report's summary. The F-100D came out as very similar to the MiG-21. The Starfighter zoomed better and accelerated slightly faster, but the fishbed turned more tightly and maintained airspeed in those turns more effectively. The F-104's gun system was superior and it had a more flexible radar than the range only set in the MiG. Although less effective against it than the Phantom, the Starfighter was at least a match for the Soviet fighter. So too was the F-5A Freedom Fighter. This was included mainly because the USAF wondered if it would be a useful proxy for the fishbed in dissimilar air combat training. The South Vietnamese did operate F-5s, but only ever over their own airspace, as did the TAC, which used their improved F-5C version as a brochure for the time. Essentially, the F-5 was equivalent to the MiG-21 in all aspects, but with a very important caveat. The F-5 was limited to Mach 1.25, whereas the MiG-21 could go beyond Mach 2. Although a good dogfight proxy for the MiG, In actual combat, it would have been rather vulnerable to hit-and-run tactics. The TAC also flew specific scenarios in which the MiG intercepted unarmed aircraft. Of these, the RF-4 Phantom could essentially use the same tactics as the normal Phantom. Its advanced ECM setup gave it a few more options for confusing the MiG's gun range and radar as well. The RF-101 Voodoo had enough speed and acceleration down low to evade the MiG. Diving at 45 degrees and creating a backdrop of ground clutter to confuse the ATOL was also a useful tactic. B-66 invaders, and by association EB-66s, were very vulnerable and needed to be escorted at all times. There was no defensive manoeuvre in their performance envelope that would allow an invader to escape a fishbed. The TAC's basic conclusion was that the MiG was broadly equal to Air Force fighters except for the Phantom. Sometimes it won, sometimes the TAC fighters won. The Phantom was much more capable when flown by the same pilots. In order to improve results in Southeast Asia, the assessors recommended the institution of a program of dissimilar training using the F-5 as a proxy. This was not done. There is nothing in the report that suggests how the TAC explained the poor kill ratio they were achieving against the fishbed. It will be up to the Navy to figure that one out. When it was their turn, the Navy sent one Captain Marlon Doc Townsend out to the desert to take a look at the MiG. Now Townsend was a very experienced fighter pilot. He was the head of the F-4 replacement air group, responsible for training Phantom pilots before they were sent out to the fleet. He'd also got serious time in most of the jet aircraft that the Navy had deployed up to this point. A Korean War veteran, he knew how to mix it in a dogfight. In Scream of Eagles, Robert Wilcox relates what Townsend found when he first strapped into his F-4 and took on the Hav Donut, flown initially by Air Force pilots. I beat them in about a turn and a half because they simply would not go vertical in it. They would pull the nose up a little bit, start turning, and by the time we pointed towards each other and made our initial pass, I would simply go vertical, do a roll over the top, see where he was going, and come down, and I'd be in the saddle. It was a piece of cake. He wondered, what's so secret about this? Easiest plane I've ever fought in my life. Maybe we're not in so much trouble after all. Suspecting that something wasn't right, the Navy brought in their own pilot, Tom Cassidy, to fly the fishbed. Suddenly, as Townsend put it, the MiG was in the hands of a different breed of cat, and it started to win. Although the aircraft would buffet at low and transonic speeds, signalling the approach of a stall, in fact it was entirely controllable, and in both regimes it could turn more tightly than the Phantom. Air Force pilots weren't willing to trust the unfamiliar aircraft in such conditions. Cassidy was. Incidentally, this was what Danny Shapira ultimately concluded on the MiG-21, and it is also what Pakistani pilots learned to do and what they taught Egyptian and Syrian aviators. The Soviets, much like the US Air Force, were against low-speed and transonic manoeuvres in the MiG-21, believing them to be dangerous. Now able and willing to extract maximum performance out of the MiG, the Navy pressed on with their testing. 
Interestingly, their findings about the performance potential of the aircraft were essentially the same as the Air Force's. Although the F-4B and J could out-accelerate the MiG-21 in most flight regimes and also out-zoom it, an aggressively flown MiG's superior instantaneous G-loading capabilities and tight-turning performance made it a very dangerous opponent in the early stages of an engagement. Any Phantom pilot who engaged the MiG below 450 knots of indicated airspeed ended up with the MiG in a firing position on his tail. If the engagement could be extended, then the MiG would ultimately run out of energy before the Phantom would and be a sitting duck. When manoeuvring against the MiG-21, the Rio needed to spend all his time maintaining visual contact with the MiG. This would have generally limited the crew's ability to use sparrows, However, the test F-4B was equipped with a system called Pilot Lock-On Modification, which enabled the pilot to detect and obtain a tracking lock independently from the Rio if the target was within 5 miles. In addition to astute control of energy in the engagement, teamwork within the flight and within the Phantom were deemed essential in order to defeat a well-flown MiG-21. The F-8 Crusader is seen by some as the best air-to-air -air fighter deployed by the US in Vietnam. Flying against the Have Donut suggests that this idea is wishful thinking. For example, the MiG accelerated better than the Crusader, although the poor engine response of the former did put it at a disadvantage when accelerating from slower engine speeds. As speed increased, the gap in straight-line performance increased with it. Zoom performance was identical. The MiG could also turn harder and tighter, although the Crusader could sustain high G turns below 16,000 feet more effectively. The conclusion was that a Crusader could not successfully engage in a turning fight with an aggressively flown MiG-21 and win. Reading the detailed findings, it's clear that the Navy was especially worried about the MiG's small visual signature. In combination with VPAF GCI, it gave the fishbed significant advantages in any engagement. They therefore saw the second crewman on the Phantom as a crucial tactical advantage. As I read it, the strong suggestion in the report is that the ability of the Crusader to compete with the MiG-21 was all down to pilot quality. In 1968, the Crusader community was essentially the only dedicated air-to-air -air fighter group in the US military. None of the Navy's other tactical fighters, the A-4 Skyhawk, A-6A Intruder or A-7A Corsair II, could control an engagement with the MiG-21, although well-timed breaks could be used to thwart the fishbed's initial attack. The Navy's findings about how best to engage the fishbed E were far more detailed than those of the Air Force. I believe this reflects the experience of the pilots that were sent to evaluate the aircraft and the growing sense of unease in the service about their performance in Vietnam. Since I've not seen it related in detail, I'm going to give you the full manual on the subject, as it were. In a sense, this assessment is one of the historical threads that leads to the methods employed at Top Gun. The authors set out 13 points for engaging the MiG-21. They start with the philosophical and narrow down into the technical aspects. From the top then, irrespective of anything, be aggressive. Then, assess your opponent's abilities. Until proven otherwise, assume the Red Baron himself is flying the other aircraft. Use combat spread formation to maximise rearward coverage and prevent the small, hard-to-see MiG sneaking up on you. Maintain 450 knots of indicated airspeed at all times when on patrol. This enables the pilot to immediately make a maximum G-turn when required. Maintain a high energy state and be willing to trade altitude for speed. Don't get tempted to try a low speed reversal. If given the opportunity to extend and gain speed and separation, take it. Force the flight down to low altitudes, taking advantage of the buffet and high stick forces that the MiG pilot will experience below 16,000 feet. Aim for a lag pursuit curve between 3,000 and 5,000 feet back. This reduces the risk of getting caught by the MiG's superior turning performance if the F-4 or F-8 pilot followed too closely and also of an overshoot. It also places the US fighter in the MiG's blind cone, allowing its pilot to manoeuvre until it is obvious that the MiG pilot has lost sight of him. Then he can move in for the kill. In fact, the aim should always to be to move into that blind cone. 
you can't kill what you can't see, and so on. Avoid dissipating energy by favouring hit and run tactics and using high speed yo yo's rather than being tempted to slow down for a quick shot. If the pilot feels that he's risking an overshoot, then rather than going for the high yo yo, execute a high G roll away in order to position for a lag pursuit attack and hopefully avoid getting caught in a rolling scissors. As soon as the MiG 21 is sighted, the F 4 flight needs to turn towards it, maintaining lateral separation to prevent a cannon attack. If committed to a head-on attack using the Sparrow, jink to avoid cannon fire and reduce lateral separation so it's harder for the MiG to turn back on the Phantoms. After the merge, F4 and F8 pilots should wait 5 seconds or 90 degrees of turn from the MiG before turning back in order to create separation. As soon as the MiG pilot initiates a defensive manoeuvre, the wingman should go vertical to present two targets. The fighters then manoeuvre independently to sandwich the MiG. If the MiG does get into a gun firing position, then the best evasive maneuver is a high G diving break. This puts the MiG gun sight pipper off the bottom of the windshield and accelerates the fight into the transonic domain in which the MiG becomes hard to use as a weapons platform. There's a remarkable amount of detail in here, distilled in such a way that it could likely be remembered even in the heat of a fight. This was the kind of deep insight into enemy aircraft performance that would form the basis of the early Top Gun syllabus. I hope I've got across the difference in the tone of the Air Force and Navy assessments here. The Air Force performed a detailed technical evaluation. The Navy were working out how to beat a MiG in a real fight. Both likely got what they wanted, but only the Navy got what they needed, a shock that galvanised them to change things root and branch. The Aerospace Defence Command played a small but important role in Vietnam. Two squadrons of F-102 Delta Daggers were in the theatre throughout Rolling Thunder, taking some of the load off TAC fighters by escorting bombers and recon aircraft. The F-106 had participated in a fly-off with the F-4 back in the 1960s. The winner was to be the primary interceptor and air superiority fighter for the Navy and the Tactical Air Force. The Delta Dart lost and was therefore restricted to its niche in continental air defence. I believe that in 1968 some consideration was being given to deploying the 6 to Southeast Asia to take over the escort role from the vulnerable deuces. In any case, the ADC flew five missions against the Have Donut to establish tactics. In general, the findings aren't overly surprising if you know much about the F-106. It can outzoom the MiG and outaccelerate through the envelope. The MiG turned better below 450 knots, but less well at higher speeds. If both aircraft were at their best turning speeds, the MiG would outturn the six. Improving visibility from the cockpit and fitting a gun were priority upgrades for the six. That's about it for the ADC. There's scant information in their evaluation, which comes across as slightly self congratulatory, if I'm honest. Have Donut produced a treasure trove of intelligence for the US aviation community. In concert with the associated Have Drill and Have Ferry programs, which exploited captured MiG 17s, the US now had a complete understanding of the envelope in which North Vietnam's fighters could operate. They understood their tactics, they had complete understanding of the weapon system, now they needed to exploit that knowledge. The results of air to air combat in linebacker show that the Air Force was able to marginally increase its kill ratio to 1.85 to 1. The Navy, having had the quadruple whammy of Have Donut, Have Drill, the Alt Report and the Red Baron Project, instituted major reforms. Foremost amongst their mitigating actions was the reinstatement of high-level, maximum performance air-to-air -air combat training. When combat resumed, the Navy's kill ratio climbed up to 12 to 1. Now this is not exclusively down to Top Gun and other initiatives, the tactical situation was a bit different for Navy aviators. But even so, it's clear that the Navy was the service that made the most of the astronomical expensive Have Donut project. The Have Donut itself was returned to Israel in 1966. I've seen the odd rumour that a different aircraft was actually sent back, but I don't see those having much credence. The Donut program continued, however. During the Six Day War, a flight of six Algerian MiG 21 F 13s were sent to reinforce the beleaguered Egyptians. 
the flight got lost and landed at an airfield that had recently been captured by the Israelis. Their aircraft were captured and four of them were sent to the US. These aircraft were extensively flown by the test group and then even by Top Gun instructors. Some early Top Gun classes were sent to rendezvous points over the desert where they would encounter real MiG-17s and 21s flown by some of the best pilots in the US. The Navy really committed to extracting every bit of understanding about their adversary. Their results bear out their success. The next time the US would get its hands on a MiG-21 would be in 1972, when they were able to obtain enough parts via Indonesia to build up several complete aircraft. These flew until about 1988 alongside license-built J-7Bs from the same source. In 1980, they also managed to acquire a MiG-21MF, which was a third-generation model of the fishbed and one of the most advanced built during the Cold War. This one was called Have Coat, if you're interested. As many as 14 MiG-21s were ultimately operated by the US under the Constant Peg program. In plentiful supply, they flew more than other types, over 15,000 hours by some count. There were no fatal accidents, unlike other Soviet types in US service, a testament to their reliability and durability. The Air Force and Navy ultimately made a film about how to combat the MiG-21. It is called Throw a Nickel on the Grass. This term, I believe, is the fighter pilot equivalent of break a leg on the stage. Anyhow, I've used some footage from the now declassified Throw a Nickel on the Grass in this video and a link to the full piece at the National Archives is in the show notes. It's a great watch and a fitting legacy to have.